and start the streaming. And that should be the stream starting up. Green light on the stream. That's all good. Recording all good. Okay. So, happy Friday. Good afternoon. Um, <laughs> immediately afternoon for you guys. Um, it's 10 o'clock at night here. So, um, this is the second lecture for our um, game programming course uh, at 300 level. Um, so, what I thought I'd go through uh, this lecture, because we haven't got around to you guys voting on what you want me to teach you for next week. Um, so what, what I thought we'd start with is, is the game programming um, and, and architecture aspect um, of what a game engine is. So certainly when we first did uh, game design in the first year and, and talked about graphics programming and, and um, learning how to program in general, we started teaching you from kind of base principles, right? We're, we're teaching you, you know, how to code. Um, ah, some people are joining us sitting through ads. That's annoying. Um, huh. Hopefully, there'll be um, the ads will finish shortly. Um, I'm, I'm, I will have to work out how I minimize the ads. Um, maybe I can turn off ad revenue. Right. Okay, I will, I will work on the, the ad revenue. Um, if you want the absolutely no ad version, then certainly over on the Discord. Um, so if you jump over to Discord, you will be able to see the non-ad revenue version. Okay? So sorry, sorry if there's an ad ad. I'll, I'll try and find the toggle switch to turn that off. So when we, we taught you how to program, we were teaching you from kind of, you know, coding from base principles and, and building up programs and designing programs. Now, certainly it, it, it is interesting and creative to start from, you know, bare metal and build up something. Uh, and that's something we do teach students how to do. Challenge is that there's a lot to build in a game. And a lot of what you build is the same between all the games you're going to use. And so what started happening is when people first started making games they realized that you know loading in assets um getting the audio working uh being able to press a key and have something on screen change the direction it was facing or change the animation it was doing or you know when i press space and it's supposed to fire there were lots of things that were identical that were the same between games and so what the game company started to do is they said, well, okay, we can start reusing some of the code we wrote for our previous game in our next game. And after a while, they started going, well, actually, we've got like a whole group, a whole suite of tools that we use to make games. And so there's this kind of thing that drives our game forward. And because it drives the game forward is the kind of the, the thing that makes it move is the engine. So we'll call it a game engine, right? So game architecture is game engine architecture, right? So this is what we're going to be talking about is, is how the modern structures of game engines look like and, and how they're used. So the first place we start is input, right? So uh, I'm doing this presentation in Prezi just because, you know, I, I like trying different things. Um, and the structural moving around feels more natural to me than just a linear um, PowerPoint. So... So we have this kind of input. We've got these big arrows coming in, which are giving us inputs to the game. Now, as a player, those can be mouse and keyboard. They can be controllers, uh, VR controllers, eye toy controllers, pens, EEG, you can have arm cuffs, uh, gaze control, uh, electromyographs uh, on your faces. They're even looking at the neuro lace, which is where you drill a hole in the back of your skull and you insert a sheath over your, uh, the surface of your brain so that you can communicate more quickly with computers. Um, that's actually one of Elon Musk's companies uh, is doing that because Elon is terrified of AIs making us redundant. And so one of his plans is to make it faster for us to interact with computers. And so he feels that if you can put a sheath on our brain, we'll interact faster. So these are the inputs you could have. So anywhere from kind of right on the brain to some movement with the tips of my fingers, right? So some, some input into the game. 
Now they generate what we call input events. Now those events come in various categories. Okay, so you would have already noticed this potentially when you looked at, at um, in, in the graphics course, you would have done key down, key up kind of events. The keyboard events are events that get put into a queue of system events that the computer deals with. We generally turn all of your gaming interactions into these input events. They can be stochastic or continuous. So stochastic means they happen at a set point in time. So a key up is something that is happening at an instant. There is an instant at which the T changes state, and that's an event. Um, the continuous events are things like key pressed, and that's something you pull, right? Because when the key's down, it stays down, right? So there's a key down event where it transitions from being up to being down, and that's a stochastic one-shot event. Um, there is the pressed event, which is actually continuous, and you have to pull it and ask it, are you still pressed? And then there's a key up event, which again is a single point in time. Now, of course, there's actually a bunch of, of um, dampening that goes on to your key presses. Technically, when your key goes up, there was an electrical switch there, and that switch flickers a few times uh, in, in nanoseconds in terms of the electrical signal going from connected to disconnected. It doesn't just atomically do it, it actually takes some time. But the keyboard manager, we don't get to see that as a game, so we don't have to deal with it. Um, but we do deal with the events. Now, so, so we've got these game events, they can either be continuous, that we have to poll, or they're events that trigger actions, and that are an action that's occurring. Now, those events come into the game in some way. Then the game's job is to process those events. And that's what we call an update event processing stage, right? So we've got this input coming in, we do an update. Now, that update is this kind of larger object where we're taking a state of the game at time t, and we're making a new state of the game at t plus 1. And we do that by doing world updates, right? Now, those world updates are done using physics systems. Right? So you actually have collision detection and particle systems and animation systems which take what your game currently is and turn it into the next state and set up what is going to be animated. Okay? So within the game state, you'll find all sorts of things. Right? So you'll find the kind of the current information. There's a lot of timers. Um, there are back, um, audio events, the environment, it, like all of the things that are happening at the world at the current time is we have in our game state. One of those is going to be something like a scene graph, which will record things like objects that have relationships. So in this case, a scene graph, which you could have used open scene graph with OpenGL and the graphic tools last year. Um, the idea of a scene graph is that you have nodes which have relationships. So if you imagine you had a robot, it would have a body and a head. And they would be from, if you take the kind of center of the chest as the robot, your head is offset a certain amount from this anchor point, right? And that would be a transformation. And that's where you see under the head here, we have the head transformation, a material, and a collision box, right? So that, those are the, the content of the head node, are that transformation, the, the material, and the... Um, the collision. Now, if we go over the body, we see the body has a body transformation from the anchor point. We have a colorization, we have a, a collision, and we have two more nodes, a left leg and a right leg. So those are, ch are children of the body, and the body is children of the robot. So if you want to trace down and find where a, a foot is, or the calf or the thigh of the robot, then you actually have to trace it back through each of those transforms back up to find the origin and then the transform down to find where the foot is okay so this is the current scene and it's a and those transformations are all set up as they are statically now the world update takes all of that state information and it processes the input events checks to see what effect those input events have on the objects and then moves forward so for example if you see over here we might have um, this kind of um, event going on here where we have a an object at position one 
after one step update, so if I've got a, a physics update, it'll move me one step, and that's position two. But there's a wall in the way. All right, so that is our, ah, there's a collision. This physics system has to work out when that collision is. Now, I'm quite happy to go deep into physics simulation. Um, there, there is quite a lot of fascinating things, particularly around time and time segmentation and how you model continuous worlds on discrete time systems because in the game everything's a discrete step in the game engine and so you have to tell your your game engine how small the discrete steps are how frequently you want it to do these physics updates and you provide information about the materials that are in the game and then it manages all of the physics details for those interactions um, and you know it, it does it does that sort of thing it also uh, will do more of this kind of trying to f work out fast ways to work out if two objects have collided by projecting them onto uh, multiple axes and then finding an axis that has them projected with a clear view between them. So there's some interesting ways in which you can project things to work out if there are collisions. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of that stuff that makes the game engine fast at what it does. It also handles updating the animation system. Now, um, the game state then moves to the next state of the game. So if you had a, an animation sequence like this one here, um, instead of being this two-dimensional sequence, the game state has moved to this one. Right? Uh, and the scene graph would have potentially changed uh, some of the, the nodes and, the, and their transformations. If it's, if it's um, an animated character, then those transformations on the legs will be changing. So that's the, the standard update loop is I have world events, they get updated by their physics system and they, they go into the, the next state. Now, one of the things you might notice there immediately, I didn't do things like saying you press the A key and an object on screen changes its X position. Now, that's the naive way of interacting with the things you see on screen, right? Is to when I press a key, it immediately does the, the action, right? So it, the, when we look at this game state, when I press a key, I just change something on screen. The problem is, if you want to have a physics system that actually manages collisions, if I press a key and then it actually moves the object on screen, um, then I don't get to do a bunch of, of other physics checks to see if you are allowed to move there. So one of the first conceptual things to do is to separate your mental model of the game, right? So instead of the game being a, I press a key, stuff happens, I press a key, stuff happens. It's a, I, I give input. The system then analyzes that input to decide whether it's going to change the model to accommodate that input. And then a whole separate system shows me that input. It's not directly connected, okay? So one of the other things that we have that's going on is that that world state is displayed out in various ways. One of the first ways is the internal way, which is through scripting. Now, this could be any kind of scripting. In fact, Blueprints in Unreal, um, it was C script and now C sharp in um, Unity. You can use Lua or Python. There are languages which allow you to communicate with the core of the engine, right? that fast thing that manages all the physics and all the updates and allows you to define settings or define character abilities or define masses and, and and give impulses, right? Give forces. This scripting language is often used so that designers can communicate with the code without having to recompile it. So when we look at how that accesses world data through an API for scripting, often this is used for AI systems. Right, because the AI needs access to the world. Now, um, there are some simple ways that the, you can do these. You can do finite state machines, the core of all computer science. Um, and those are a simple, they can be set up as simple behavior systems. You, you can write behaviors in a finite state machine and have the states trigger events in the game. Okay, so that's so it's very simple AI. You can have behavior trees, which are more complex because they have 
sequence and selectors and they can have weight functions and there are functions that are down particular routes and it will iterate through them um, and so you can have much more complex description of behavior in a behavior tree uh, so that's another type of AI um, we have sort of sometimes lower level things like a star where you have a, a, a search which is a way of pathfinding uh, we can also use goal um, goal oriented action planning another form of AI which interacts with the game engine through a scripting language okay now um, these give you kind of more power in a different way of describing solutions and you know of course you you do the standard things like in, in, in unity rather than actually having to do the scripting language you, there's also a, a UI uh, and drag and drop features and a whole bunch of standard tools that are built into the engine because that's what there's a collection of tools that allow you to quickly do a whole bunch of useful things like pathfinding on a static level right so there's there's those sort of skills um there are there is you can do more with scripting um so in wow the the entire ui so rather than ai the entire ui user interface was scriptable through lua because you can think of it as configurations and rules and so all of the the elements that you had around you could you could configure those yourself right um, we've actually now got engines where the scripting was no longer just used for AI it's used to define the entire game right so the game engine has kind of stepped back into the shadows a bit and said no no, no you don't need to code the engine anymore you can just script on top of this architecture on top of this engine and that's where you start seeing things like Unreal's blueprint as a visual scripting language uh, and Unity with C Sharp as its scripting language. You are not writing the game engine. You are merely telling the engine features and characteristics and descriptions of objects and how they interact. Okay? It will deal with all of the rendering and the update loop and, and the event management stuff. Right? So you no longer do that. So once it's done, a time T to time T plus one, it then moves to doing a display. So display can be both audio and visual. Right? So at the moment, you're both hearing me and some of you will be seeing me. Um, now, to get that right, you need a lot of timing information and that requires buffering for audio because that kept the timing right. Uh, and animations is related to timing in video. Right? So you're not just showing a static picture, you've also got to think of the time it's been since you last showed an image so that your animations don't become strange and jerky or slow down as the game slows down and then suddenly speed up and jerk around and like massively over respond right because it doesn't feel like the world exists then it just feels like you're playing a, um, a, a tape that's been wound too fast okay so when we talk about video rendering right we're talking about the graphics and we talk about audio rendering as display as output um, we talk about the the sounds and and the way in which they're played and how they're played and the timing for those. Um, now, this is about taking what the model is and creating a view on that model. You could have an audio view on the model. You can have a video view on the model. Those are the two main senses we use. You can also have haptic feedback. So you can have the rumble bars on your, your rumble in your controller. Um, there are pressure pads you can use that, that, that hit you when you get shot, for example. But mostly it is audio and video videos audio is is remarkably important when you're developing your game and when you're using the game engine it's easy to get audio into your game engine say putting that in until you're feeling a bit down about the project because audio makes your game feel much more alive right so it's a useful kind of wee kick in your motivation to get you working again so don't just burn all of that immediately while you're still enthusiastic. Save that audio bit for when you need a boost in the project. Video rendering. Um, what we've mostly been talking about and up to this year, pretty much, we have still been doing um, rastered video, right? So we've taking, we're taking triangular projection onto a two-dimensional screen. And that's what you learn in OpenGL. You learn how to take vertices, project them onto a two-dimensional screen, and then march between two known vertices and just fill in the colors, right? That's, that's how graphics has been for 40 years. 
40, 50 years. Um, we are just starting with the 20 series, 2000 series of, of graphics cards. And with Unreal 5, which we can't quite use yet because it's only in, uh, it's, it's in closed beta still. Um, the 2000 series of graphics cards have built in ray tracing. So we are, you, you are just on that edge of moving to a ray traced, polygon rich rendered environment where the model we have for the world can be as complex as we like because the rendering is a ray traced, ray traced into that complexity. So we don't have to minimize the number of triangles. We don't have to do some of the work we used to have to do. And that's where the tool of the game engine is now is changing the standard pipeline. Right? It used to be you make, make kind of simplified models for games. As of um, Unreal 5 and uh, PS5, but also PCs um, with the 2000 series graphics cards, we will be doing real-time ray tracing and suddenly our whole pipeline changes. Right? So the game engine is about to change the way that we think about graphics, the way we see rendered scenes. Um, they're going to become much more realistic. One of the other outputs is your network output to the rest of the world. Right? So the network output is this idea that we are sending data from the game to other players. Right? Now, it could be a server where we're just doing things like recording high score. We could have a chat system where I chat to anyone else who's in the lobby with me. Or it could be the full game is being sent back and forth. Now, in fact, with um, Google Stadia, for example, we have now moved to saying, well, actually, 5G current optic fiber networks are good enough that I should be able to have the, the machine that runs the game sitting somewhere in the middle of the city. And I'm just here with my screen. And when I press a button, it sends that input instruction across the network to the server that's running the game and the server just sends me back a video stream of the game. So I am not running the game on my device. My device is merely streaming video and sending inputs. Right? That's that's what Google see as the future of gaming. Um, so the networking aspect is becoming interesting and complex. So some of your clients are very thin and so have no processing, so it's not peer-to-peer. -peer. Some have a good gaming PC. And so they can do peer-to-peer -peer stuff. They can simulate on their own machine. They are going to be networked. They are going to be sending data back and forth and managing multiple connections, right? So when we talk about games and game programming, we can also dig deeper into some of those networking things that you learned um, in cloud computing and also in network computing. So that's a kind of input events. Now, go through the event processing, the world updates them, gets a new state, that state is fed to the display, um, the world state is also fed out to AI, which then generates new inputs. So the AI generates new inputs and the networking generates new inputs. They come in and then feed back into the game engine. That's basically what a game engine does. All right, so when you look at something like um, Unity 2020, um, this is an example of a game engine. And here you can see it's got the inspector up and I've got a selected item. And so it's the safety hat is the selected item. And you can see there that it's showing me its position and its rotation and details about it. Um, so I can edit it directly. I can click on it. I can move it around. I can interact with this scene in a visual way. And then in my code, right, I, I'm able to script behaviors and the game will implement those. And the game provides me with a large number of libraries and ways of interacting. So the best way of learning Unity is not me to sit here and talk you through it. It is for you to go and follow the tutorials from the Unity um, site, which has a, a, a learning tutorial um, a, a system attached to it, to start going through. If you've never used Unity before, the best option is to go through their latest tutorials. Now, one of the challenges is that Unity has been changing quite a lot in the last 18 months. So it's moved to a new rendering pipeline, a new entity component system, which we can talk about, uh, a new networking system. So it's, it's updated a lot of the way it does things. 
So you can't just go to a, you know, learn Unity video from three years ago on YouTube and go, hey, great, it'll teach me how to use Unity. It won't, because it'll teach you how to use Unity in the way Unity used to be, right? So what you have to look for is tutorials that are aligned with your current version of Unity, okay? So um, this is, is Unreal. Um, looks relatively similar you can see that we have you know again some objects we have some ways of interacting with them we have some play buttons up the top there that allow us to interact with the game um, it also uses blueprints which um, if you're interested we can get into which are program flow control it's a scripting system that means you don't have to write code to do the scripting right so you know it's a, it's a different a different tool potentially a little more complex in some ways than Unity. However, with the changes that Unity have made recently, we're not sure what's the best tool anymore. Now, I can't recommend one over the other because they're both good and they're both bad. So you guys will have to find that out. Okay, so, but, um, so one of the things I thought I'd show you is actually like, look at some code in a game engine that was a released game engine. Um, so this was from it, the Doom engine. But before I do that, I'll just check if there are any questions on the Discord. There is one saying hello. I will say hello back. Hello. Um, so no, no questions on the Discord. It seems that you guys are there, and that's fine. Um, and I've only had the two comments on Twitch. So um, hopefully there are some of you, um, some of you here. Yes, there are. Some of you there, that's all nice to see. There are some people watching. Um, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to do that. Right, so what I thought I'd show is I'd go, seeing there aren't any questions yet, I would show you some of um, the Doom engine. Now, this is a very old engine, but what's interesting about it is how badly coded it is, right? How kind of obvious and simple the code in this engine is. So um, this is the, the structure, the architecture of the game engine. Now here you see they have a game x86 DLL and it has a whole bunch of interesting things in it. So it has actor and camera and entities and um, triggers, right? So these are things that are the, the core objects that they knew would be in all games. So we're always going to be a camera in a the game. There are always going to be actors and entities in the game. There are always going to be triggers that make things happen. There's always going to be an animation engine, a physics engine, a scripting tool, um, uh, interactive agents tool, and the id class, right? So those are things we're going to be in every single game. Doom 3 specifically created interactive services. It had its own renderer and its own sound because they were being updated, right? Because they, they, were, they were specific to Doom right? because it was the, that was the... Thing they were pushing forward on uh, and it had some uh, console and low level systems right some that it, that it had and that shared with the the dll right so there was a the the game itself were some specialized things in the game and then there's this generalized game tool dll that it had and then there was a, an even lower level standard library that they did for parsing dictionaries geog um, geometry stuff hashing functions maths Things that were very, very kind of utility based, right? So that was in the Ed library, and they had the uh, the, uh, the URL lookup stuff and just C and C plus plus and the standard C libraries, right? So that was that was the structure that they had. So if we actually have a look at the code that was released by as by Ed as the Doom Three engine, right? You'll see some stuff that you might recognize in here. So we we see things like you know int Win API, win main. Okay, main. Wow, it's got a win main. Neat. So that's 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 an introduction line for a C plus program. C plus plus program. It's a it's a main call. Uh, this actual H instance is the the window, right? So it passes in the window the handles that it's got, and some some command line information. Right. So okay, that's yeah, that's a that's a, a main start. Um, then it does something interesting. It goes set physical working memory 192 
shift left 20. 1024, shift left 20. What? What's going on there? People on Twitch, tell me. Tell me what's happening. Do you know enough of your... Of, of what's going on in code to tell me what's going on there. Twitch or Discord, either one. Are you alive? I assume people are alive out there. Is it too early in the morning? Midday, can't be too early. Um, any ideas on what might be happening there? Because some of you would have been doing C++ and would have seen these as kind of, you know, C out redirects and be wondering what the... <laughs> I'm alive, but I have no idea. Okay, so this is being particularly hacky. Um, right, what this is, is that double arrow is actually a bitwise operator. Right? Um, so, yes they are setting the size of working memory manually, and that is a bitwise shift operator. Now, 2 to the power of 10 is, a th is about 1,024, right? So 2 to the power of 20, because I, every time I shift, that shift is a multiply by 2. So when I shift it 20 in that direction, right, shifting it left, so it gets bigger, um, that is... A thousand times a thousand, so twenty is ten is is the ten times ten. So that's actually a meg. It's a thousand bytes, a million bytes, rather, right? So this is saying that the physical memory is going to be allocated somewhere between one hundred and ninety-two meg and one gig of memory for working memory for Doom Three. If you cannot allocate one hundred and ninety-two meg of RAM. The game will not run on your system. That's what that does. It's hacky, right? But that's how the game that that was like you know line one of the of the game was to do a bit shift to create the working memory size, right? Really, like what we might think of as low level dirty hacking of the system, right? So, um, so yes, that's that's how Doom was written. So, um, sys create console, uh, and then you know, it then does like a for loop, which you guys are used to seeing for loops, right? It's pretty standard for i and i equals i, i less than max critical sections, initialize critical sections, win thirty two critical sections. That is just a for loop that initializes all of the multi-thread critical sections. Stand for loop. Easy to understand. Right? Um, we then, then do things like um, common thread. And then, then here, this one. This one's also quite fun because, you know, I've got the system. Ace, start async thread. Okay, so that's going to start an asynchronous thread. And what does the thread do? Well, it says while one. Now, um... So the question we have on on Twitch there is is are are they upfront allocating a large amount of memory because there was limited memory and we don't need that today? And the answer is well, no, no. You still need to manage your memory. Uh, in fact, games are one of the few places that do actively manage memory. Uh, and game engines, certain gaming engines, do a lot of work to try and manage memory because. Memory is one of the slowest things you have to interact with. Right? It's furthest from the CPU. So we actually still allocate memory up front and we try and allocate all the memory we think we might need so we never have to ask for more um, because asking for more takes time. So even though you've got a massive amount of it, because of the rules of, of because of the laws of physics, right? When we talk about, you know how, like when we make, Computer smaller, right? You do 14 nanometers or, you know, we're down from 20 nanometers or 28 nanometers, right? So part of the reason to make things smaller is because the speed of light is fixed. And so the only way to get faster is to make things closer together, right? Because they can only 
electricity can move at a third the speed of light than that's at. So if you want your computer to run faster, you have to make it the, everything closer together. Now the problem with RAM is if you make a massive amount of RAM, the edges of your RAM are further and further away from the CPU. So you don't, even though you have massive amounts of RAM, you, if, if that RAM, because of physical space, has to be a long way from the CPU, it's still going to take a long time to access. So we still want to minimize the memory, allocate a certain amount of memory, and just work within that amount. Right? So games still do this, even though, yes, other programmers don't need to care. We as game programmers actually care. So this one is doing a while one. Now, I personally hate while forever loops because a while one true while true or a while one loop here um again one isn't true one is just a number that happened to equate to true right um which is annoying because this isn't actually telling you what it's doing it's saying well the number one um so for some reason this runs it constantly never stops it does a use sleep of sixteen thousand six hundred and sixty six just because I happen to know that that's the u sleep microseconds for running at 60 hertz. This is this is how they program Doom 3. Um, and it and so it sleeps for 60... That So there's no parameter that says what the maximum hertz rate is in the game. There's no, there's no like proper variable. It's just a magic number whacked straight into the code that the person hand worked out. Whereas before, they did a shift. Here, they couldn't even be what, well, because it runs constantly to does the sleep, they wanted it to be a fixed number. So they just put the fixed number in here as 1 60th of a second in microseconds. It then does common async. It triggers the thread once it wakes up. And then it says trigger event 1, and then the P3 says cancel. So what this is doing is once every 60th of a second, it pings the asynchronous task and goes, ha ha, next time step, and starts up the next um, frame in the game. You know, so the game can be running in itself, get to the end, and it just stops, and it then waits for this asynchronous tick that someone manually put in, 16666, as the timer. Okay? So, you know, again, nasty hacky code. Um, and, you know, if we look down here, we have another while loop, which goes through the frame. And how, like, so, so one of the interesting games is that your render is different to your world state. Remember I was talking about that update? And then display? Well, this is where we're saying within a frame, right? So there's a, when a frame happens, right? So a session frame. I go through and run all of the game text to run now game text are the physics updates and the frame is the render update so i go through a for loop where i run the game text and inside that that's a defined function Whew. um i go game run text and i have its command uh and then i go through four entities and active entities next Entity is not null. Entity gets entity active node next. And I say, entity, get your physics, run an update. That was the code to run the physics, to, to manage the running of the physics update, was to step through all the active entities using the next iterator until you got to the end of the entities and then, and for each one of them, run their physics update. Not hard, right? Not that's that stuff you guys have learnt in second year. You know? um, you could do this sort of level of coding. That's what's at the core of the Doom Three engine. You know? uh, and then here you see there's a session, there's a, a, an update screen. So um, it it sets the update to false. It then begins code. It says. Oh, look, okay, I'm, I'm taking over the screen. Don't, don't do anything to the screen. I'm then going to render it. So it then does the render, right? So that's just a render system, begin frame. And then it calls the draw. And then the, it, it says the end frame. And then issue commands. Right? So that's the 
that's the the thing it does at the as it goes through the next drawing it does that session up okay so that's that is that code was released as part of them releasing the source for doom 3 yeah in unreal as a game engine if you can get into the source code you can dig into it and you find that there's sdl code in there right standard dynamic library code in the um, in um the in unreal right because unreal is built on top of that library which is part of the reason why they have some of it as being open sourced it's because some of the um the tools in there are gpl right the whole it doesn't make the whole system gpl because of the way that they've used it they've kept it separate and core but the, that code that library is still there now when we look at gaming so we can sort of look at them power versus complexity uh, what I generally think of is as power going up and complexity going out. Um, when we think about things like Scratch, um, they are not very powerful and not very complex. And we can work our way all the way up to kind of the CryEngine and Rage, which are like, and Unreal and Unity, which are both highly complex, but also very powerful. Okay, so they're kind of all up there. Um, now, where they move uh, as they get keep being developed all the time they get better and they're worse and you know it, it is it is hard to know the best engine to use um i think basically you use the one that you want to learn and that you when you do an analysis it looks like it can do what you need it to do okay um so that was that was i, I thought i'd go quickly through an overview of gaming architecture um and then in terms of the the course where we're at um is that's the wrong get app uh gk so what we're going up oh, actually that's not and i'll go to the the i won't go to the the um wiki area because uh oh i didn't mean to go the wiki. right go to here right that's right <laughs> i <laughs> I don't know why it took me there. Anyway, so um, in documentation, I've created a game. De well, I've, I've um, taken a game design template and given which um, had one of the standard ones from um, the CS, the University of North Carolina, um, computer science there. Uh, and you can see the link to the, that course that they did this. Um, this is kind of an initial template for a game design document. So for this course, I'm, I'm grading you on a portfolio assessment by the end of the course. So um, I'm not actually grading you on give me a game design on week three. Okay, that's not the sort of assessment we're doing. However, the reason to write a game design document isn't to satisfy me. It's so that you have a record of what you're trying to build, right? That you have a plan and that you can communicate that plan with each other. So... I want you to create a game design document for the games you create. You need to work out um, the engine you're going to use. You need to work out the game genre you're going to, to um, be doing, the type of concept it is, the audience, and start working through these kind of aspects of a game design document to communicate between you and the rest of the team what you're going to achieve. Right? Now, the reason we talk about game uh, engines is because I expect most of you will use either libraries or engines. Right. Some of you already suggested using um, ACML or Python, uh, and some of you have. Uh, I think one group is thinking about doing um, uh, God the um, Godo engine, um, and uh, yeah. So there are, and and I know there's at least one Unity group, right? So so people are going to be choosing now once we've got these teams together. What kind of games? What I want to do is I want to meet with each group, and and have a Discord, Zoom, video, whatever meeting, and step through what game you're planning to make. And then we can talk about, does it hit all the technical things that we want you to learn? And then I might ask you to add things to your game design document that are specifically there so you will learn more. Right? Now, um, one of the other things I want to do is um, I'd like to go through the, the issues. I've added a few more issues. So I've, I've added that, that game design document. Um, 
I added a few more issues here, um, which are about the um, game, like the, the kind of things that we could have a lecture on. Now, I see a whole bunch of you have upvoted, uh, I'm not sure who, but a whole bunch of you have upvoted um, the game AI. Um, we also have networking and multiplayer, which has got a few votes. Game engine architecture, which we did today, great. We're, we can now put that in the in the done list. Um, GPU and shaders, multi-threading, and I've done the introductory lecture. So there's also data management, telemetries, group methodologies, optimization of code. So the idea here is that each week we go through these issues and we start defining what you want me to teach you next week. Okay. So I can, I, know I could just go through all of these one time in my own way, but I'm really interested in what order you would like to discuss these. At the moment, it looks like game AI is pretty high on your list of, of interest areas. Um, so we could certainly run game AI as the next session, right? Um, and I will link game AI to the stuff I started here when I started talking about architecture and the, and the scripting um, and how game AIs work. Now, we could also have a discussion on how deep you want me to get into game AI, right? Because I've I've taught whole AI courses on game AI. So that can be, you know, I, I could spend the rest of the um, term, the rest of the semester, just talking about game AI because it's amazing. But we need to narrow that down. So what we could do, um, ah, right, so I had a question about what, if not wild tree, what would I have? Right, so um, so what we could do is, is given this grooming, we could say, right, I will keep, I will give you an introduction to game AI next week, and then we can look at if you want to dig deeper into some of those topics. So we had a question here, um, from a programming point of view, uh, if not a while true, then what? Okay, so the reason why, the phys philosophically, the reason why I dislike while true is because it lies to the programmer. It lies to me about what it's going to do. Because it's saying, hey, I'm going to run forever. Now, we both know that that's a lie. Now, it's not going to run forever. Something's going to stop it. Okay? there is going to be some way of exiting the program. So it shouldn't lie to me and say, while true, it should say, while running, right? Or while execution is true, right? And then what I could do is I could look for where it sets execution to false. Because then I know, ah, so that's the variable that I need to look for to find where it exits, right? Because there are other ways it could exit. It could exit on a break. It could exit on continue. It could exit um, with a crash statement. It could exit with a go to. Right? A while one doesn't tell me what what way you're planning to exit the program. It just says, "Ha ha, I'm not going to tell you." Um, at least tell me the variable that you would use. And if it's a zero, it's not going to keep running. And then you just set that boolean value too false when you want to kill that particular loop, right? And then I can actually debug my program and go looking for where it sets that value to being zero, right? I don't need to look at every break and work out if this break is within the outer loop or within an inner loop that's not going to break the entire function, it's just going to break the intern. Ah, right? Because any, any break could be the break that kills... The, that, that loop. So so it doesn't help you understand how your program is working by your program lying to you about what it's doing. I also dislike lies around um, for loops that don't intend to go through all of the items. Right, so a for loop that says, no, 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 I'm not really a for loop, I'm just a while loop that's been written badly. Right, that is a lie. If you're a for loop, you are supposed to be at least in principle stepping through each item. If you're going to stop at a known lo at, at some location, then that's a while loop, not a for loop. I know that the code becomes the same, right? A while loop and a for loop come up from the compiler point of view to end up looking identical. Fine, right? 
But if you say for loop to me, it means you intend to step through all of the elements. If you say while loop to me, it means you intend to stop at some point. Right? So it's it's not whether or not the code works, it's what that code says to the other game programmers that you're dealing with. Right? So it's the communication you have with other programmers, and that's why you prefer certain structures to other structures. It's also as a game programmer why it's really important to understand a whole bunch of games, look at a whole bunch of other game code so that you know how to communicate as a game programmer, right? What are the structures that we use and how do we use them? So what is clear communication given the context of other game programmers? Okay, so um, so um, still a while, um, but a different um, logic um, to set the state. Like, well, game is running. Yes. Um, so so that that's is, you know, while is um, game is running. Uh, and, you know, you could actually do the, the is running as a, a boolean, um, or you could do it as a function, but a boolean is probably reasonable because you wouldn't have to go looking up at each time. However, even if it was a function, the compiler will say if that's a static function, if it's a function that refers to something, the compiler might be able to run time get rid of that test because it knows what that value is going to be, right? So because it, it can calculate a whole bunch of things. Um, does the subject of optimization code teach us um, these lies and other mistakes and how to fix and, um, and improve code um, that have these lies? Yes, yes, I will, in, in, included in my optimization of code, I will talk both about how you actually make code run faster and the problem with um, pre-optimizing without actually thinking about how your game engine works. So, you know, you, you may have been told some stuff in previous courses about what might be faster, right? Um, and particularly, and I'm, I'm sorry to criticize um, some of my colleagues, but um, O notation, like big O notation, irrelevant. Just not particularly useful in games at all because what it measures isn't what happens in games right so um when i i, I even saw this and I'll, I'll again you know this is going to be recorded so people know i'm saying this but i'm fine with this um uh, so i was looking at a, a second year assignment uh, from trondheim um the exam and they were claiming that a linked list implementation of a snake game, so you've got a standard snake game, right? It was a linked list. And they 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 didn't they weren't using a game engine, they were just using straight code. They made a linked list of a of a um, snake, the snake game, so you'd uh, delete a tail and add the head, so the snake would move around. And they're saying, oh look, order notation. The linked list is faster because it does one operation to add and one operation to remove, rather than their vector implementation, where the vector went through every element of the snake and updated its x, y location. Well, when I implemented the code in a modern C++ compiler that they had in the exam, um, the vector was faster up to 200, a length of 200 units. Right, so your snake had to be 200 units long, longer before the one delete and the one update, one insert into a linked list was faster than doing 200 vector um, operation, 400, because it was X and Y. So 400 operations on 200 length snake. Right? That was as fast as doing one memory push onto a linked list and one pop off the back of it. Right. However, once you actually also included the cell collision aspect of Snake, because you've got the Snake game, and you know how when you, you know, if you run into yourself you die, that means you need to check your head, your new head that you're about to append against every other um, node in the Snake. Immediately linked list is always slower than the vector. So that order one operation and order n to step through 
the, the number of items and the vector had to step through all the items. So it looked like your auto notation that the linked list would be better. The linked list is always, always, always massively worse than just using a vector implementation. All right? So that was someone who was using theory from computer science, applying it to a game and going, oh, I know how to optimize this. I'll make it a linked list without doing the work of using the profiler to actually check how long things were taking or comparing their original code with the optimization they thought it should be. Okay. Now, when you look at the snake on screen, your mental model is not, oh, this is a snake which is it's having its tail destroyed and having a new head being added. That's not what you're thinking. You're thinking the snake is moving around the screen. Now, of course, as programmers, you know the snake isn't actually moving. Well, if you were describing what was happening, having a vector where the snake's xy position of each, each element of the snake was updated to the one before, so the, the whole snake actually did, in the model, move around the screen. Given that that's actually faster than doing this order one thing where you create and destroy at the end, you can then do a bunch of interesting things like, oh, I can actually have a text snake and the texture will move with the snake because I'm physically, I, I am in the model moving the snake. So I'm actually not lying to you. I'm telling you the mental model that it works with. And it just so happens that that's also faster, right? So when I talk about optimization, we're going to dig into that and why that is and and how you use multi-threading and, and how you actually use profiles and actually understand um, code. So so yeah, I, I, I'm I quite keen to talk about optimization. Uh, it's probably useful to, to have some examples. So it would be useful for you guys to come with some examples of code that we can review and I can optimize with you, right? Um, so we might leave that till slightly later in the course because it's quite good to do, but it's quite good to do later. Um, we can do game AI really kind of upfront. Um, in terms of other lies, um, I can I can show you a whole bunch of code that's really really terrible, very optimal, and I would never want you to write it. Um, we we will go down professional and commenting style, and I will comment on this in your code because because I have your repos now, I will track you through the semester because I want to see the code you're developing. Uh, and I will comment on your comments because your comments should be there to help me find what's interesting in your code. Now, you don't, if, if you don't need to tell me how your code works. You're not trying to teach me. Right? I can read code. Right? That's not a problem. When you do something weird, you need to comment it. When you make a decision that is unusual, that would throw me, then that could be a comment. But mostly what we do is smart commits so that the issues in your repository are connected to your commits, right? And so we're gonna we can talk about smart commits um, and and using issues in your Git repos so that you actually can comment your code in a professional manner and so that you know, as you're you're creating your games, you're able to also work well as a team. Okay, so so I'm going to spend some time working on sort of some of that project management stuff, partly because games are such a complex thing to do. Particularly, um, you don't have this so much for you, but when you have a team with lots of different skills coming together, there's a lot of project management to do. So game teams and the communication within game teams are a significant part of game programming. And that's partly because programming is communication. It is communicating between me and you as other programmers. Yes, sure, the computer is listening in. And yes, we want that to be smooth and fast. But if I can't communicate with other programmers what's going on, my code becomes unmaintainable and the project collapses. Okay. Now, uh, although I was complaining about Doom and its magic numbers and its, its stuff, um, luckily within their culture, they because they were all dealing with timing, they all knew that 16,666 was 1 60th of a second in 
um, milliseconds and microseconds. Right? So, so that is, you know, they just knew that, right? And so it was kind of just, yeah, everyone knows that. So it's common. And that works within their small team. The problem is when that team has to work with other people outside the team, suddenly some of those conventions fall over. So, um, can we have a break? Yes, sorry, I, 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 I had, I'm, I, I was, I was going to give you guys a break. Now, um, what we can do is we can have a five minute break. I'll go away. I'll refresh my cup of tea. Uh, I'll come back, and then what we might do is I'll turn off the Twitch stream because you guys have seen this discussion. Um, and what we'll start to do is go into the Discord and I'll start chatting to the groups about what their plans are and we can start working on the um, the issues in the GitLab to try and um, make sure that you've got, you're, you're starting to make some of those decisions, you've got the game engine you're interested in. Um, also, we can start discussion, this, this grooming of the backlog to say what next week is. Just before we go to that break and I turn off Twitch, um, People on Twitch, are you happy with AI as the next topic next week? Or do you think it should be more on group methodologies and working well in groups? Or do you think going going straight into AI is good? So at least one person's happy with AI, another one. It will be an overview because I can't do it all, but we can start, we can lay it out, we can talk about AI, and then we can see if there's more stuff you'd like to talk about deeper into game AI. Cool, okay, so looks like we've got some good Twitch comments for game AI. I'll say goodbye to the Twitch stream now, and I'll stop that recording, um, and I'll go into Discord, go have my coffee, come back, be in Discord, I'll be there, and I'll chat with people, I'll hang around, and we can we can chat about what we're going to try and achieve in the course, uh, and uh, what the games that are going to be made are, and what your, your focus is, right? So rather than do that in public, because this is quite public, we'll do that in Discord. And if you want to, if we want to jump into a DM, we can do that to discuss things if you'd prefer it that way. Okay, so um, five minute break. I'll be back at um, quarter past, um, quarter of 20 past. Uh, and then we can go into Discord and we can chat about the games and the course. Great, okay, I'll see you there. <laughs>